I'm Sharon Hill. This video is an examination of the stone tape idea, which includes some geologic concepts. So let's start with a brief geology lesson. This is a piece of quartz. Quartz is the most common mineral found on the surface of the earth. This piece is actually a large single quartz crystal, but most quartz is found in much smaller grains that make up rocks such as granite or as sand grains on a beach or desert or cemented into sandstone. This is a piece of limestone rock. Limestone is also incredibly abundant and has formed huge deposits of great thickness by a settling of the calcium carbonate directly from prehistoric seas. Both quartz and limestone are said to have a special significance to those who investigate paranormal events. They propose that limestone or rocks with quartz have a role to play in explaining haunted locations. It's important to critically examine questionable claims to see if there's any merit to them and if they're even plausible to consider. Those who accept the claim without evaluation can seriously mislead and in turn mislead others. And generally, that's terrible for society. So in this presentation, I dig into the stone tape theory explanation for ghosts and residual hauntings from a critical thinking perspective. The stone tape idea is used by several amateur paranormal investigators and on ghost hunting TV shows as a possible explanation for a haunted location. But they never tell you the background of the idea or if it has any plausibility. So that's what I'm going to be talking about here. I'll cover what it is, where did it come from, potential mechanisms, popularity, and is it an explanation for hauntings? So the premise of the stone tape concept is that the rock, either the underlying bedrock or the building stone, captured emotional energy from a traumatic event. The preferred rock type is said to be quartz, but limestone is mentioned nearly as frequently. The process is as follows. Sound and or visual representation of an event are recorded into the fabric of the rock media, similar to how a magnetic tape records data. At a much later time, years, decades, or centuries, a person sensitive to this energy can receive the playback, or the playback can be initiated by certain conditions. The recording playback sequence has long been used as an explanation for apparition sightings, hauntings, and negative feelings associated with the location. Amateur paranormal investigators suggest that the stone tape idea may be the potential explanation for what's commonly termed a residual haunting. Residual suggests something that was left behind in the past to account for the current events perceived. In this type of experience, people report experiencing images, sound, and apparitions that do not interact directly with people, but instead play out like a movie or recording. The experiences are specific to a location, and if there are multiple claims, they are typically fairly consistent in description. Initially, the stone tape theory requires the assumption that there is a real phenomenon where people repeatedly experience an anomaly explicitly related to a certain location. A person may perceive this event as a ghost encounter or haunting, a place memory, an odd feeling about the location, or what appears to be a sense of going back in time. It also assumes that there is some genuine mechanism for recording, storage, and retrieval that we have not yet figured out. The stone tape is often called a theory, but what is a theory in science, and is the stone tape a scientific theory? In the scientific sense, a theory is not a guess or supposition. A theory is a well-tested model of the way something in nature works. A scientific theory works well enough to predict what sort of observations you will find based on the conditions that exist. Theory is not the right word to use for the stone tape since there are some serious gaps in the concept. There are no good answers to the following questions. How do things get recorded? What gets recorded and what doesn't? How does it get preserved? And how does it get played back? We can't use the stone tape idea to predict where and when there will be hauntings, or not. Therefore, the stone tape theory isn't a theory in a scientific sense, it's speculation. And the word theory, in this case, is used to mean guess. But 
theory sounds sciencey and authoritative, and I contend that the use of the word theory by people referencing this stone tape idea gives the speculation a sense of credibility. Where did the idea come from? As with many cultural products, bits and pieces originated from a variety of places, got all changed up and mixed together, and made a new idea. This idea can take on a life of its own, whereby many people who later adopt it don't even know its long history. And this complex evolution appears to apply to the stone tape theory, theory as well. If you search for references to the term right now, you'll find that modern paranormal media frequently state that the stone tape idea originally originated in the 1970s, but only the name did. The concept in various forms goes back over a century before, and the idea that information imprints on the environment for later retrieval has a long history. The concept of the environment or fields recording impressions from humans was proposed by mathematician Charles Babbage in 1838. He believed that the words made permanent impressions on the world and that, quote, the air itself is a vast library on whose pages are forever written all that man has ever said or woman whispered. In his volume, The Ninth Bridgewater Treatise of 1838, Babbage stated, quote, The pulsations of the air, once set in motion by the human voice, cease not to exist with the sounds to which they gave rise. This is a nice idea that our words live on forever in the universe, but there is no evidence that it's true. The idea of place memory rolled around in the early days of the Society of Psychical Research, or SPR, the first and most influential scientific organization that focused on the study of extrasensory perception and experiences. The SPR considered place memory as a hypothesis to account for apparitions that seemed distinctly associated with a location. In the 1880s and beyond, SPR researchers proposed that there was, quote, something in the actual building itself, that acted as a mechanism for hauntings. Leaders of the SPR like Edmund Gurney, Frederick Myers, Eleanor Sidgwick, and Oliver Lodge expressed similar ideas about survival of an image generated by the mind of a person that was later perceptible by certain other sensitive minds who were open to anomalous mental communication. H. H. Price was a professor of logic at the University of Oxford and a former president of the SPR. In his presidential address printed in the Proceedings of the SPR of 1938 and 39, Price asserts that objects can carry memory traces. If a suitably sensitive person comes to the place or handle the object, these memory traces will cause him to have a retrospective experience. In this loose set of ideas, Price said that a psychic ether is the media between the spirit and physical matter, where images and memory traces were held. Price also did not think ghosts, as people describe them, were supernatural, but that they were, quote, traces, a result of the emotions or other experiences of some person who formerly, formerly inhabited the room, like fingerprints or photographic negatives that would be developed by those who were endowed with the ability to perceive it. These traces and the psychic ether are not independently observable, though, making them unmeasurable, a serious drawback for scientific acceptance. However, Price remarked that if these traces were real, quote, they must consist in some more or less permanent mode of arrangement of the molecules or atoms or infraatomic particles of which the walls, furniture, etc. are composed. And in that case, it ought to be possible to verify their existence by the ordinary method of physical science, by physical or chemical tests of some sort or other. But so far, we know this cannot be done. The stone tape idea is also attributed to Thomas Charles Lethbridge, a controversial and colorful archaeologist who left academia for paranormal research. Lethbridge's 1961 book, Ghost and Ghoul, is also frequently cited by amateur paranormal investigators as the origin of the stone tape theory. Lethbridge, however, never used the term stone tape in this or subsequent books. In his book, though, Lethbridge hints that some memories may be connected with inanimate objects via a sort of surrounding ether. 
He also states his belief that all cells resonate at a particular vibrational frequency that could explain these memory transferences. And in a later book, Ghost in the Divining Rod, in 1963, he develops this idea more thoroughly. Lethbridge does not contend that ghosts are supernatural, but argues they are attributable to invisible fields that record an image of a person. He names these fields after Greek mythology, around water bodies, naiad, forests, dryad, mountains, oread, and even a field of the earth itself, g. These fields, he proposed, are charged by ions in the air and enhanced by additional imprints from a person's own psyche field. Lethbridge thought some places, such as those notorious for suicides or uneasy feelings, would accumulate these negative thoughts in a snowball effect, making a spooky sight even more dramatic. He also supposed that humid conditions enhanced conductance of the fields and paranormal effects because the water molecules helped recharge the fields, which could keep recording imprints forever. You can find ghost hunters today checking weather conditions and claiming that paranormal events are more likely in human conditions. Lethbridge rejected Price's psychic ether idea for his own special fields, and instead thought that since the potential of these natural fields was high, persons who had low personal psyche fields of their own would receive the existing imprints because higher potential flowed naturally to a lower potential. And this would explain why some people could experience the imprints, those with the sixth sense, while others could not. But again, Lethbridge's ideas were not tested and have no basis in what we have so far discerned how nature really works. It's a nice idea, but without merit. As I said in the beginning, the name The Stone Tape was first used in the 70s. It was the title of a 1972 BBC drama by Nigel Neal. The movie was titled The Stone Tape. In this effective horror film, we see the primary influence for the packaging and delivery of place memory to modern hauntings. The premise of the movie is this. A team from an electronics company move into an old house to work on a new project. Renovations to the place reveal a long, hidden, very old stone staircase. Strange phenomenon is observed in the room. Screaming is heard and an apparition of a young woman appears on the stairs. But not everyone can perceive it. Sound and video equipment do not record it. The playback is dependent solely upon another human who has the ability to perceive it in her own brain. The story centers on this soul, soul woman in the team, uh, Jill, who has this ability. And the success of the movie popularized the idea that old stone blocks can store sounds and images that possibly could be the mechanism for hauntings. T.C. Lethbridge's ideas were around during the time that Neil was working. It's almost certain that they influenced the plot device in the stone tape, but I haven't found any direct connection. Lethbridge died in 1971 before the movie aired, so it is incorrect to say that he coined the term stone tape. The connection was, in fact, applied retroactively. We see that the historical root of the stone tape con concept is complicated by plenty of other people who had similar ideas, and it's difficult to trace if they borrowed from each other or came to such independent thinking uh, by themselves. Lethbridge cited the work of Price, and Price had heard things from his SPR colleagues long before that, but also we have the popular psychic concept of psychometry. The idea of memories captured in rock is closely associated to the belief in psychometry, which is where a gifted person can psychically read the impressions and memories stored in objects such as rock pieces or jewelry. Though psychometry was promoted by reputable, reputable people as the revolutionary future of geology or archaeology, this never came to pass. The evidence is far too poor to conclude that objects hold any memories, and there remains no plausible mechanism for this to occur. However, you will still see psychics say that they can do a reading off an object, and such readings are vague notions or, or measured guesses. Let's discuss the proposed mechanism for the stone tape idea. 
Mechanisms for the environmental recording and playback loop include invisible energy fields, molecular architecture of the crystalline quartz, energy fields from dead organisms that make up limestone, resonant frequencies, encoding of iron oxide crystals, inductive electromagnetism, and quantum entanglement. And there may be others that I didn't think of. While all these ideas sound superficially plausible and impressively sciencey to explain location-related hauntings and phenomenon, the crucial problem with the stone tape idea is that there has never been any demonstrated way to record, preserve, or play events via this natural environment as proposed. A main issue in the stone tape description is that the encoding of the memory relies on emotional energy records, which are non-material. That is, em emotion is not a physically recordable energy that leaves the body. Emotion does not create an energy like electricity. Nothing related to emotion leaves the body, so there is no data put into the environment to be recorded in the first place. Some paranormalists invoke quantum entanglement to account for experiences. And they're quite fond of using Einstein's view of spooky action at a distance, which he used to describe quantum entanglement. And they also assert from thermodynamic equations that energy can be neither created nor destroyed. But these scientific concepts are grossly misapplied out of proper context. Few in the world are qualified to explain quantum physics, certainly not any paranormal investigator, so I will simply point out that there is no evidence that this concept is relatable to events on the human scale or relative to past events being replayed in the present. Quantum physics does not explain ghosts. You can go ask the next quantum physicist you find to confirm that, that if you don't believe me. An update to H.H. H. Price's place memory is that the imprints are stored in the electronic cloud, electron cloud, excuse me, or molecular structures. If the object has the same resonance or frequency, they would be connected and transmit information. The same concept was used to suggest how ESP might work too. But again, the idea is mere speculation. It has not been tested and is not plausible considering real world observations and conditions. A speculative geophysical idea into haunting experiences also describe fields where the Earth itself acts as a photographic exposure plate to record the event or moment in time. When inductance matches between geomagnetic activity of the Earth and the local static electricity field, a representation of the environment is recorded in the crystalline structure of the rock, essentially a geologic hologram. This hologram is then surmised to be played, replayed directly to the brain when the conditions are right. And several paranormal investigation websites will refer to the space weather forecast to note if solar activity is high, which is assumed to be conducive to experiencing paranormal activity. Now, I may be sounding just like a broken record at this point, but there is zero evidence that such a situation occurs or is even plausible. The amateur paranormal investigator commonly cites recording onto local materials such as quartz, limestone, either rock or building materials, or rust on metal objects like nails, screws, wires, and structural components. Now, it sounds superficially plausible to those who don't know about the study of mineralogy that highly emotional events like violent death can release emotional energy sort of akin to electricity, that gets recorded onto these mineral crystals or coatings just as sound or images are recorded onto magnetic tape in a tape recorder. Inventors discovered the ability to record onto a magnetic wire in the 1800s, and this eventually became a usable technology with magnetic tape around 1930. But this analogy to magnetic tape is flawed. There are specific technical components of recording systems, such as the magnetic heads on recorders, that don't have a natural equivalent. The Earth's magnetic field is not strong enough or precise enough to imprint a distinct sound or image into randomly existing crystals in surrounding materials. 
Emotion is not an energy like electricity, which actually is a stream of charged particles that we can measure. Also, humans do not have a sophisticated response to magnetic fields, regardless of what alternative health gurus tell you. So how can anyone read such tapes? Can we perceive the content of recording tape by running our fingers over it? No. We can also argue that if such a recording could occur, we probably would have discovered repeatable examples of it by now. So it's crystal clear that the concept of environmental recording of human feelings, sounds, and images that can be stored and retrieved is useful in different contexts. It's also obvious that there's no current reasonable mechanism to accomplish it. All the ideas about it are imaginative speculation or suppositions. They haven't been tested or confirmed to any degree. And those that have some basis in scientific theory have not been shown to be applicable to real world situations or the claim that hauntings are, occur at certain locations. But because the concept sounds sciencey and plausible to those without scientific background, they become popular. The idea of recording in stone and crystals was around decades before it was incorporated as a plot device in the stone tape. Lethbridge himself might have been forgotten after his death, strange ideas and all, if not for popular paranormal writer Colin Wilson. Wilson re-injected Lethbridge's ideas into popular discussion via his widely read books on paranormal mysteries. Wilson's books were immensely popular with paranormal enthusiasts from the 70s to the 2000s. Lethbridge's poorly formed speculation about location-specific fields as an explanation for hauntings was discovered by a new generation who were not going to dig through the SPR archives to find the historical precursors to it, but it sounded really great, so they used it and continue to suggest it today. We can reasonably conclude that, at best, the stone tape remains an untested hypothesis with no, no, no reasonably known mechanism for recording, storing, or playing back a memory. There are many psychological and physical explanations for perceptions of haunting and a sense of spookiness that should rationally be applied before suggesting unsupported explanations like the stone tape idea. Although many amateur ghost hunting groups call out the stone tape idea as a scientific theory and one that has some evidentiary support, as I've documented here, it doesn't have empirical support. Professional parapsychologists hardly even mention the term in their professional literature. Even though we have been talking about this general concept for over a century, we are no closer to having it make sense, and it remains an unsupported but appealing and convenient notion to apply in paranormal discussions with the public. So there you have it on the stone tape theory. It's not a theory, it doesn't make physical sense, and there are no known mechanisms for how it works at all. It was though a good fictional movie based on old ideas that meshed to become ingrained in paranormal culture. Now that you know more about the background of the idea and how it's been hyped beyond the evidence, be very wary the next time you hear the stone tape theory suggested as a real-world explanation for a haunting.